Hello and welcome everybody to this brief video. I want to give you a quick teaser about distributed system control, which is a lecture I'll be teaching in the upcoming semester. Okay, I want to show you a few examples, so you have an idea of what this lecture is about, and briefly discuss the contents to hopefully motivate you to participate in this lecture. Let me get started right away with an example. The an example I want to look at is uh, an average length of a sense of network. So, as those of you that are from Zurich will probably see, on the right-hand side we have a map of Zurich and a bunch of sensors, uh, wireless sensors with some communication links in between them that are placed over the city. Uh, for simplicity, I just chose the uh, different campuses of ATI Zurich throughout the city, uh, but you can think about this, of course, being a much more dense and widely distributed network. Uh, but for sake of illustration, let's just consider these four nodes. Very good. So every sensor, say sensor 1 at node 1, measures an environmental quantity x1. Think about we want to measure air pollution in the city, so we measure the aerosols at different points, and then we want to figure out our best estimate of what's the air pollution right now. Of course, each and every sensor will be biased, will have noise measurements, and now you think about how do you best aggregate all these noise measurements into one scalar measurement of city air pollution. Okay. And of course, now you can leverage various physical algorithms from signal processing, but often at the end, the solution is, well, the best thing you can do if you have two measurements that are equally uh, distributed, equally affected by noise, well, the best aggregate measurement you can construct is the average. Okay? And we want to do so now in a distributed fashion, that is, don't communicate all these measurements to the base station, but we want to figure out an algorithm that does so only with local peer-to-peer -peer type communication and local computation. So what would node 1 do? Say node 1 here at the campus Eta Hungerberg would talk to its closest node, say node 2, which is at the campus in Erkel, and figure out what's the average of our measurements. So what node 1 would do, it would say, well, I'll take measurement number 1, I take measurement number 2, I take the average, so times one half, and this is how I update myself. So x1 plus is x1 plus x2 over 2. So definitely that's one way of doing it. Well, what would node 2 do? Would node 2 would also look into all its nearest neighbors that it can reach with some local say, communication range and would accordingly update the measurements. In this case, the node in the campus at Yerkel can of course talk to the campus in the center, the campus at Dübendorf and Empa, and the one at Hungerberg, so it would do, it would say, well, I update my value um, again as the average of everybody that I can talk to, x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus x4 divided by 1 over 4. And you would keep on doing so for all the nodes that you can have here in this network. And of course, this is most interesting when the network doesn't consist just of four nodes, but you have hundreds of thousands of them distributed all over the city. Overall, of course, you can see this gives rise to a matrix iteration, which looks like x plus is ax, where the matrix A has some interesting properties in terms of its sparsity structure will encode this graph, this proximity graph, who can talk to whom, then there's an entry, say node one cannot talk to node through, and node number three, so a13 and a31 of this matrix are zero. Uh, other entries are strictly positive. Um, further, um, as you can see, every row of that matrix would encode this averaging operation. That means, among others, every row sum of that matrix sums to one in this case, the so-called row stochastic matrix. Now, what happens when you carry out this algorithm and you keep on averaging? Well, if you're lucky, things are going to converge, which will actually be the case here for this particular example. So you start off with all the initial measurements, you execute like two, three, four, five rounds of these algorithms, and you quickly converge to the average value. Okay, so we converge to the average of the initial conditions. And the question we now may ask is, well, will this always converge? How does convergence depend on the topology of the underlying graph structure of the sparse pattern of the A matrix? Will it converge? Will it not converge? How fast will it converge? And this is one of the basic questions we're going to answer in the lecture. Let's say in the first three, four lectures, we'll actually have a complete answer to this problem in terms of uh, both algebraic uh, theory, so matrix theory, as well as graph theory. Okay? So this is one example of when to study in this lecture. 
Let me give you another example, which is not now from distributed sets and networks, but from something which you probably just executed to find this particular video. Namely, let's look at the PageRank algorithm, also known as the Google PageRank. Uh, it goes as follows. You type into a search engine a keyword, say control in Zurich, and you get a whole bunch of web pages here, right? So you get our institute page, you get maybe our control center, the NCCR, you get the department, the DITED, maybe get the Swiss Automation Society, maybe get ETH, maybe get EPFL, or many other pages. Now, how does your uh, favorite search engine, I'll leave it to you to decide which one it is, rank these pages in which order do they appear? So, well, how do you, how does it determine which page is important? This term by an algorithm called the page rank. Namely, it says a particular page is important if many important other pages point to it. So as you can imagine, ETH Zurich web page is one that is very highly ranked in the algorithm because many other pages are linked to it again. And these pages are no small ones, for instance, the department or it's the EPFL page, right? So that's why ETH Zurich is probably an important page. So let's formalize this definition uh, in terms of some algebra to see what it means. To, to do that, we first need to introduce a matrix, just like here, a matrix that would encode the sparsity pattern of the World Wide Web. So that's again a matrix of elements AIJ, okay? where AIJ is zero if there's no link from node i to node j. If there is a link, one or multiple, from node i to node j, then actually it's a strictly positive entry. And the entry goes as follows. It's actually the number of links that are going from node i to node j divided by the total number of links that are going out of node number i. Okay, So it's some sort of relative importance of the link from i to j as it's normalized by the total number of output links of node i. Okay, so let's see if we can formalize this definition of page rank and well, what it has to do with, with any of that that you've just seen. So, page rank. So let's first make a definition. Let's call xi to be the importance of page i. And then the formula goes as follows. The importance of page i, well, page i is important if its neighboring page is important, all the pages that point towards node i. So what you do, we need to sum of all pages j and their importance is, and we only sum over those that are pointing towards node i. So I need to put here an a j i according to the definition of this matrix. Okay, so this is now a recursive equation that nicely incorporates this definition. And you can easily see this is again just an eigenvector equation. And we have x is the matrix A, in this case transposed x. Transposed because that's the way I define it here. Okay, um, why also another reason why I wrote here transposed because if you remember this matrix of the properties, the rows sum up to one. By this definition, this matrix property, the columns sum up to one. Okay, so just to make it symmetric, I just transpose. Now, so what is your favorite search engine doing when it evaluates in which order to show you the pages? It just solves a huge eigenvector problem. Huge meaning, well, I don't know, millions and millions of nodes, right? So this matrix is large, okay? Now, of course, solving such a huge uh, eigenvector problem is very costly. You don't want to somewhat invert such a matrix. So what you do, you have to leverage sparsity and come up with a clever iterative algorithm, namely what um, the surgeons would just do. They would just iterate this. So you write x plus is equal to a transpose x, which is just a fixed point map, which if you evaluate in steady state, gives you back this equation. Okay, does this converge now? Well, good question. Again, it depends on the topology of the internet, of the World Wide Web. And it turns out very likely will not converge because there are some pages in the web which only have ingoing links, but no outgoing. Think about something like a PDF that is somewhere um, linked online. Likely will have no other links. There's also pages which only have outgoing links, but you know, poorly nobody links back to the poor page. Which means you know, there could be rows and columns of today matrix which are entirely composed of zeros, and thus this thing may not converge. So what is normally done is that this type of um, iteration is regularized in terms of, you know, there's a small epsilon added 
times a matrix of all ones. Meaning there's a probability epsilon that you link to any possible page and that is added here. Okay. And uh, this may now converge, right? It's called a random search. So this is one other example of what we deal with in, in the lecture here. And maybe now you realize the connection between this and that example is essentially it's some sort of transposition between the two. Let me give another example we deal with in this lecture from a completely different domain. Namely, let's look into biological flocking type phenomena. Let's in this case look at a swarm of fish. As you know, a swarm of fish uh, moves almost like a rigid body. That is, all the fish would move in unison, have the headings aligned and nicely float through the ocean. How do they do this? Well, that's not the point of this lecture to figure out the biologic from how to do it. But what we want to understand is, well, can we model this type of phenomena? Can be then reverse engineered and eventually put this say, on a robotics form. Okay, let's find that some simple laws of motion that would make this fish actually synchronize in the headings. Okay, so let's look into swarming. So let's model every fish simply by its heading. For simplicity, that is the fish number i has a heading theta i relative to some global reference, same for fish number j. And now an easy way how to make fish synchronize the heading would be to think about, well, what if there was a virtual spring in between two fishes that would sort of pull them together? In particular, a spring that would only act on the heading, okay? That would create a force that this fish starts turning this way and that this fish starts turning that way. And there may be many such springs in this war, okay? So if you work out the spring force, and project the spring force onto, say, the polar coordinates, so you're only interested in how does it affect the heading, you will end up with a motion law like this. So let's write down the kinematics, say the rate of change of the angle of fish eye is in this case given by minus the sine of theta i minus theta j times the spring constant, let's call this aij, and there might be many such springs between the fish, so we sum of all j. Okay? So again, this AIJ matrix holds the sparsity of terms of which fish is close to which other fish and how to interact with which strength. And it turns out if you, you know, code up this type of equation, uh, this will nicely produce this type of swarm behavior, a very simple one. This may also realize if you were now to take this nonlinear equation, you linearize it and you put it in discrete time, you end up with a very similar averaging or page rank type algorithm as here. Okay, so it seems like there's a pattern in nature. And indeed, this will be one of the first topics that we studied in our lecture, uh, namely, you know, what's the underlying theory? Is there one theory that explains all of this? And yes, there is, okay? So the lecture will be composed of, you know, three pillars, and we put a few things on top of it. What are the three pillars? This, the first one, is something you have to bring. So I expect you to know linear system theory, a little bit of non-linear system theory, and of course you need to be excited about matrices and the linear algebra. What we'll develop in the course will be the following. We will look into graph theory, in particular how graphs connect to matrices. We'll look at the problems like uh, algebraic graph theory and spectral graph theory. We'll then take these properties, say algebraic graph theory, and throw it onto a linear system, such as this one, where we study properties of the linear system as a function of the matrix, which is again, one-to-one -one connected to a graph. And this will lead to things like these averaging algorithms at a discrete or continuous time. Okay. So this will be sort of the basic tools uh, laying out the foundations of the lecture. What we put on top of this, we put their uh, synchronization, Markov chains, classic stability and so on. And then we mention different special topics where all of this is useful. These special topics, we choose different one area when we give this lecture. This year we decided to spend a few lectures on distributed optimization. That is, can you use any of these algorithms, say such algorithms, as primitives to solve computational problems, in this case optimization problems, which are distributed over multiple computers and machines. Okay, so you have a peer-to-peer -peer network or parallel computing network, and you're wondering how do you most efficiently solve a big problem over many machines and how does this work? 
we'll look into resource constraint control, particularly event trigger control. For instance, in the sensor network, maybe not everyone can talk to everyone else all the time, but only once in a while because they want to save on the battery power. So we'll look into this as a particular case. We look into robotic coordination, where swarming will be one problem we look at, but we also look at us like formations, coverage control, deployment, and so on. Finally, you know, we'll illustrate all of the theory down here with many other applications, not just these three here, but many others in sociology, think about opinion dynamics over a network, or you know, distributed computing problems, epidemics, power system synchronization circuits, biological synchronization, and so on. Okay? So this will be the menu for this lecture, um, and I hope you're all interested, and I'll see you all in class. Thank you very much.